We're in the midst of a great religious revival. Probably the greatest since the First Reformation. But before we examine this situation, it seems to me that we should take a look at the First Reformation in order not to repeat its errors. That's not easy to do because history is a very tricky subject. We can extract from it almost any argument with proof that one chooses. For instance, Lincoln, during the Civil War, wrote a very famous letter of condolence to a Mrs. Bixby. The letter started off, you are the mother of five sons who have died gloriously on the field of battle. Unfortunately, the president had been misled. Two of Mrs. Bixby's sons were killed in battle, but the third was captured at Gettysburg and later swapped in a prisoner exchange. A fourth deserted to the Confederates, and the fifth deserted and fled to Cuba. And Mrs. Bixby herself was an active pacifist who sought to dissuade all her sons from volunteering in the first place. <laughs> that misunderstanding, however, is minor compared to the difference between Lincoln's own reputation when he was alive and in the White House and the legend that has been attached to his name since. He began his term with an anti-slavery position that has been, to say the least, that was at the time extremely unpopular. He added to that unpopularity by deciding to hold the Union together by force. His predecessor, Buchanan, had said the Union was held together by popularity and can never be cemented by the blood of its citizens. Buchanan said that in December 1960. In November of that year, Lincoln was elected and most of the South seceded. Lincoln took office in April 1861. By then, Jefferson Davis was already president of the Confederacy, and the state of Cold War existed. Not long after Lincoln's installation, a hot war began, and millions in the North who had hoped for a peaceful reconciliation and who wanted to let the South go blamed Lincoln. He added to their resentment by becoming the first wartime dictator of the United States, and in that capacity, he first ushered in Fiat paper money, suspended the right of habeas corpus, instituted military rule, freed only the slaves of the Confederacy, ignored the rulings of the Supreme Court, had men arrested and held in prison on suspicion alone, and in general made himself intensely unpopular for the duration of the conflict. The wonder is not that he was assassinated, but that he lived so long. <laughs> With our history so strangely distorted by those who do not trust the intelligence of the people, you can imagine how a great upheaval like the First Reformation has been twisted by those who hate organized religion in general and Christianity in particular. Of course, those who are against organized religion are like those who say they favor education but are against schools. It doesn't make very much sense, but nonsense flourishes as long as nobody provides a rebuttal. Much nonsense has been written about both the Renaissance and the Reformation. The Renaissance was a period launched in Italy which threatened not only the supremacy of the Vatican, but the entire fabric of Christianity. It began in politics, 
an area that lures those who have lost their religious faith in God and who seek to usurp the powers of God on earth over other people. The great God politics. We know him very well. Millions go to his temples, sacrifice time, money, and substance in order to obtain his bounty. Politics in Italy during the Middle Ages was dominated by the Vatican. The Vatican had money and territory, and its great influence kept the Italian city-states from consolidating into a, into a single nation. A city-state, however, is relatively easy to dominate. The numbers and territories are relatively modest, and in time these city-states were taken over by local warlords who called themselves dukes, princes, counts. They ascended to power by bribery and murder. They pushed the church aside and took over the administration of charity, of hospitals, of the handling of commercial rights, monopolies, and licenses. They taxed and taxed and spent and spent. And one of the means by which these many despots attained and kept their popularity was by becoming conspicuous patrons of the arts. Painting, sculpture, music, clothes, architecture. In virtually every instance, the ruler of the city-state was the sort of man who could venture out amongst the crowd and call hundreds of people by name. They were very genial and charming in person. They had to be to retain their popularity and their control of the area. And what these despots represented, according to our modern historians, was the face of the future the centralized secular state. To this day, many of our historians swoon like groupies over the Medici, whose murders and thefts equal that of the Borgias. What dazzles them is that Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo worked for them and other great artists lifted into prominence by the patronage of tyrants. To read about the government during the Renaissance is like spending time on a police blotter. All that one can discover is a list of odious crimes, incest, patricide, matricide, fratricide, arson, poisoning, treachery. The mafia calling itself dukes and princes. All their misdeeds, however, were nothing compared to the injuries they inflicted upon Christianity. Christianity was then represented by the Vatican, which, Burkhart told his students, had become something to be exploited and was for a considerable time in the hands of blasphemers who had obtained possession of it because it had become too desirable and was poorly guarded. At a time when the Vatican ruled over an international network, to seize its control was to enjoy its influence. The corrupt monsters who wore the mantle of Peter began to charge for confession, for pardons, which they called indulgences, and to operate an international extortion ring claiming supernatural powers on this earth as well as in the next. That stage took a while to achieve, but it arrived. It made the church hated and it opened the doors of doubt, immorality, and vice. What this meant was that first Italy, and then France and Germany, Spain, Portugal, England, 
abandoned the rights of the citizens that had marked the Middle Ages and turned into despotisms. The church in all these areas was both permitted and resented because the new money-raising efforts of the criminals in the Vatican took money out of those regions and sent it toward Rome. Now, we have no means of knowing, after all this time, how far down the loss of faith extended. But we do know that those who remained religious were cordially hated by those who had lost their beliefs. And this is, of course, a constant phenomenon. The faithful always arouse hatred. Meanwhile, in Italy first and then in other places, inquisitions arose, launched and operated not by the church but by the state. Torture, for the first time since Rome, reappeared as an instrument of prosecution. In the ages of faith, torture was unknown. It was against God's law. At the same time, the loss of faith in God led by a process with which we are still familiar, but which is still very strange, to a belief in the devil. Satanism arose, and the black mass. Women claiming to be witches who were actually amateur medical practitioners who sold potions that could kill or cure, depending upon what the client desired, became common. Orgies reappeared, as in ancient times, in the palaces for the rich and in the woods for the poor. Aphrodisiacs, love potions, spells, Curses, complete with effigies, all the common superstitions of the ancient world, diseases from the grave, so to speak, reappeared. A belief in astrology, the oldest myth of the ancients, people flocked to have their horoscopes cast. What sign were you born under? Everybody knows now. Printing a new art spawned books on magic and pornography, and meanwhile the despots restored the ancient bloody games of Rome by burning witches and warlocks and those whom they branded as heretics in public. Very popular spectacles. The Reformation appeared not a minute too soon. It's questionable if Christianity would have survived another century of the Renaissance. And those who hate Christianity today, and there are a good many of them, have never forgiven the Protestants for not only bringing an end to the Renaissance, but also for reintroducing the Bible to humanity. For, of course, the Vatican had abandoned the pretense of being a biblical faith. That is the reason why the priests made such bitter efforts to keep the Bible out of the hands of the people. The convent of Erfurt had one of the early Gutenberg Bibles in its library. It was a huge volume, about two feet long, about a foot and a half wide. One of the young men in training to be a monk at the convent, saw it, opened it, and was amazed. I was 20 years old, he said later, before I had even seen the Bible. I had no notion that there existed any other Gospels or episodes other than those in the service. His name was Martin Luther. The Reformation began in a spirit of inquiry which soon led to a jungle of argument and division. We should not have expected anything else. Men released after centuries of intellectual captivity were bound to argue. Furthermore, the Reformation in Germany was shadowed from the start 
by the desire of the princes and the local warlords to have an excuse to take control of the riches of the church. The first effect, therefore, was a series of confiscations from one group and a series of local churches springing up under leaders of varying quality. In Germany and parts of Switzerland, the result for revolution was shocking disorders. Luther decided that it was better to join the princes than it was to allow anarchy to continue. So each prince determined the type of church to be allowed in his realm, which meant that the state took the final step toward omnipotence on earth and claimed the right to control not only the body but the mind and the soul of all citizens. The second great influence was when Calvin brought theological order out of disorder. Calvin and Knox, between them, directed the victory of Protestantism in Holland and in Scotland. It was in Scotland that the theory of two kingdoms in one realm, one spiritual and the other temporal, one represented by the church and the other by the state, was reaffirmed. It is from the Scott version of Calvinism, in other words, that we receive the American tradition of the separation of church and state. Of course, John Knox is not very familiar here, nor for that matter is Calvin. But it was their arguments that influenced the mind of America even though the origins of those arguments are not today well remembered. The dissensions that splintered Protestantism, of course, are well known. The doctrinal disputes that the public school teachers ridicule are notorious. To this day, there is not a single public issue that does not evoke the quarreling figures of Protestant clergymen contradicting one another. We must count this as a central reason for the decline of Christianity in the West. This is true even though Protestantism ushered in a new attitude toward work in which every calling was considered a form of worship. This meant a break with the attitude of the Renaissance in which the only reason for work was to attain worldly riches and power, to advance one's own fortune, and had no other meaning. Work in the Renaissance was to be dedicated to the glory of God. The spirit of individual inquiry and self-examination introduced by the Reformers is with us to this day. The modern secularist who holds the Renaissance up to us for its advances in painting and sculpture, architecture, and in the arts in general, are very silent about the great scientific leap that inspired and was fueled by the Reformation. And of course, as so often happens, the success of the Reformation led to its decline. The spirit of inquiry led first to science and exploration and the rise of technology and then to the questioning of all values and finally through skepticism and an adoration of the human mind to the various enlightenments. I mentioned those earlier, discussing revolution and the great contemporary assault upon Christianity. What we see when we look back at the last four centuries has been a struggle between a resurgent paganism and our faith. For the most part, despite the success of Calvinism and Knox, Christianity has been losing. The lowest ebb came in the period during and after World War I. In 1917, in the midst of that dreadful conflict, 
Pope Benedict XV issued an encyclical which said in part, there has been a gradual falling away from the strict standards of Christian virtue, and men are slipping back more and more into the shameful practices of paganism. The causes of these evils, he continued, are varied and manifold. No one, however, will gainsay the deplorable fact that the ministers of the word do not apply thereto an adequate remedy. Has the word of God then ceased to be what it was described by the apostles, living and effectual and more piercing than any two-edged sword? Has long-continued use blunted the edge of that sword? If that weapon does not everywhere produce its effect, the blame certainly must be laid on those ministers of the gospel who do not handle it as they should. For no one else can maintain that the apostles were living in better times than ours, that they found minds more readily disposed toward the gospel, or that they met with less opposition to the law of God. At the conclusion of that war, the despots of Russia launched the persecution of Christians that cost the lives of 180,000 priests and nuns. Churches and cathedrals of that nation were sacked, and most of them turned into atheist museums. A similar pillaging was conducted in Hungary under an individual losing, using the name Bela Kuhn and a wave of persecution against Christianity was launched that is still underway in the name of communism, that was temporarily waged in the name of Nazism, and that continues here with weapons so far limited to regulations and propaganda. To term this an anti-religious crusade, is not exactly precise. The Bolsheviks, when they seized power in old Russia, made anti-Semitism a crime and anti-Christianity a state policy. To some extent, that pattern has continued everywhere that the modern totalitarian swing back to paganism is penetrated. That is not to say that Judaism is responsible Judaism suffered the same decline in its adherence in the modern century as has Christianity. The numbers of Jews who believe in traditional Judaism are relatively minor compared to the world Jewish population of some 16 million. What the Bolsheviks and other totalitarians did was to use the disaffected of all religions against the majority religion most likely to organize a reaction against the omnipotent state. That is Christianity. For it is Christianity that is founded on the theory that every individual has God-given rights that not even governments can restrict. The Bolsheviks sought to enlist the support of minority peoples held in subjection in the Russian Empire. Toward that end, they offered special privileges to Georgians, Latvians, Poles, and others who had broken away from Judaism and Christianity. Their revolution, in other words, consisted of organizing the minorities against the majority of the Russian people. The appeal of that revolution was in the name of peace, land, and liberty. And for a time, all sexual excesses were forgiven. Abortions were free. Divorce was made easy. Liquor sold without taxes. Everyone was told they were equal to everyone else. In the midst of this, those who objected were, of course, murdered. So the carrot was toward the basest impulses and the stick was deadly. I need not tell you how far this appeal has carried. 
You all read newspapers and see television. You know that the revolution has penetrated the highest reaches of our intellectual circles. Our schools, even our high schools, even our elementary schools. You know that large and important sectors of our tripartite government are anti-Christian. Ultimately, those who applaud this trend may find themselves and what they hold dear similarly threatened. But at this point, it's Christianity that is in peril. Our situation can be compared in every particular to that of the people of the Renaissance in its darkest hour. The Vatican has once again been penetrated, as in the hands not of an especially bad pope, but of revolutionaries who are masquerading in Latin America, in Africa, and in the United States as spiritual leaders. Where Europe was externally threatened 400 years ago by the Turks, we are threatened today by totalitarians whose empire is gradually enveloping the oceans and the nations of the world. And where the early leaders and people of the Reformation were subjected to the persecutions of governments in the Vatican and those libertines who wanted to destroy all tradition and abandon all restraints and do away with all religions, we are confronted by the mocking voices of the media in all its multiple avenues. The world of art and fashion is arrayed against us. The world of politics and of false scholarship. All we have on our side is God Almighty. <laughs> And, of course, that means that we cannot lose this war. In the Soviet Union, after 67 years of unrestricted power, the commissars have discovered not only that Christianity has not been destroyed, but that it is today the greatest and most significant threat to their continued authority. And what is true in Moscow is true in Warsaw and in Washington. Not because of the West. The most shameful silence prevailed here regarding the fate of Christians in totalitarian lands. In China, in Nicaragua, in Cuba, in Hungary, in Romania, in Estonia, Latvia, Finland, Georgia, Cambodia, Africa, Bulgaria, and other places. What is happening in those places is that men have rediscovered first the reality of the devil, and then the Lord. So Chenitzen tells us that of all the millions in the Gulag, all that have been there can be broken, excepting the true believers. Now some have said that we need that sort of experience here in order to restore the faith. One pastor at one church I attended was training the congregation to learn the hymns by heart in order that they could sing them during the coming days of their imprisonment. The poor man couldn't believe in the inevitability of Christ, but he could believe in the inevitability of the revolution. Others are writing and speaking about the tactics of resistance and of the need to store food against the coming calamity. They don't say much about faith, but a great deal about safety. But there's no safety without faith. Meanwhile, the revival has started. There are millions who have left the main line helpless and hopeless churches and have started new and vigorous congregations. This tide stretches across the land and has not even been noticed by the press. It has not been discovered by Dan Rather. It does not advertise, nor does it need to. 
Some of its leaders were once revolutionaries who discovered the seat of clay at the seat of that false god. Others are young people who watch the disintegration and decay of their predecessors at home and abroad and want no part of such a failure. In the aggregate, this amounts to the army of the Reformation. It differs from the old in many important respects. <coughs> it's not doctrinally minded. It does not believe in attacking other Christians for lesser matters of faith. It is, in the aggregate, a multitude that has subconsciously accepted the fact that fundamentally a Christian is a person who believes in the divinity of Jesus. This realization has been a long time coming, but it comes at the right time. It has long been accepted that one can be a Hasidic Jew, a Reformed Jew, an Orthodox Jew, without ceasing to be a Jew. And it is only now being realized that one can be, in the same sense, a member of one of the many churches, many Christian churches, Protestant or Catholic, of whatever group within these sprawling edifices, and still be a Christian. If we identify ourselves in that manner, our children no longer have an identity crisis. And then we realize that there are not three major reasons religions in this land, Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish, but only two, Christian and Jewish. These realizations are mostly subliminal. The Reformation underway is largely taking place without the mainline clergy or the great seminaries. These centers of denominational orthodoxy <coughs> still cower before the ridiculous assumptions of psychiatry and the state. They still appear opposite Dr. Rushduni in trials of Christian schools to assure the government that they are obedient to the demands of the bureaucrats of governmental education. But the rise of these Christian schools speaks for itself. The appearance of pastors like the Reverend Sullivan, willing to go to prison for his faith, speaks for itself. The crowds that appear to react against discriminatory regulations and legislators speak for themselves. Of course, we have leaders, we have books, tapes, films, and arguments. Above all, we have the Bible. And we have the example of centuries before us. We have the tradition and the methods and the accumulated wisdom of the ages to draw upon. We are millions strong. We can change governments. We can change the world. This time, we are not intent upon building churches and power structures of our own. We want to alter the entire fabric of global society. We want to restore the vision that ruled at Geneva and in Edinburgh and in Amsterdam, even though that vision is lost today in those places. And where the original reformers had the printing press, we have the computer, tapes, films, books, pamphlets, speakers, and teachers. The other night, someone in our group said, uh, isn't it interesting that the communications revolution arrived just when we needed to spread the word of God? And Dorothy Rushduni smiled and said, indeed it is. Very interesting. <laughs> Equally interesting is the fact that these computers, tapes, cameras, other communication vehicles are common here in the United States and not elsewhere. In the USSR and the, Eastern, the countries of Eastern Europe, typewriters are registered and their characteristics are on file to prevent the use of unauthorized communications. In the recent crackdown in Poland, the authorities simply took over every telephone switchboard and put solidarity leaders in a position of individual isolation. In that manner, they broke the union within a week. That can't be done here. 
The only way to stop computers here from communicating with one another <coughs> is to cut off all electrical power. And to do that, the country would have to shut down. What we have, therefore, in addition to congregations numbering in the millions, are the instruments of intellectual and religious liberty handed to us by the grace of God to influence our own land. And in a world where nothing is coincidental, and where God rules the sparrow and the leaf and the spirit alike, these conjunctions are not accidental. In my opinion, God intends that the Reformation will appear here first and spread from here around the globe. And in this new Reformation, the divisions between Christians will be healed, and the Bible will be restored, and Christian Reconstruction will restore ethics and science, love in art, happiness in families, and faith in God everywhere. Thank you.